and welcome to the Keystone Central School District's uh, work session for July 1st, 2021. We will start with the salute to the flag, a moment of silence. Call, please. <clears throat> Mr. Donahue. Mr. Elling. Present. Mr. Johnston. Here. Mr. Cope. Present. Ms. Lynch. Here. Mr. Miller. Here. Mr. Probert. Here. Ms. Smith. Present. And Ms. Strau. Here. We have a couple of presentations tonight. Uh, the first one is the updated health and safety plans. So that would be me, along with um, some members of our administrative team, were able to get together last week and put together a draft uh, health and safety plan. You'll see that this um, health and safety plan is uh, called the ARP, ESSER Health and Safety Plan. And the reason that it's called that is because the third wave of ESSER funding um, is, in, is titled the American Rescue Plan ESSER Fund. And so in order to receive those funds, we are mandated to have an updated health and safety plan uh, in this template. And then the board is expected to approve a health and safety plan uh, for our school district. So this health and safety plan um, is the same, is a template that they provided just this last time, but it's a much more streamlined template. I think they learned a lot from the first one and they simplified it somewhat. So there's not a whole lot of change in the meaning of the plan, but um, what I'd like to do is guide us through the, the nine main components to, um, to share with the, the group. Are you able to share that plan? Sorry, my computer must have just been crashed like two seconds. I'm gonna, well, Chad's finding that plan. It's further down in the agenda. It's a link down under board business. If you check, um, just select one of those plans, that would be fine. But basically the first three pages of the plan are really part of the template and the directions. And then starting on page four is the summary of the plan. And um, this plan would be, if approved by the board next week on July 8th, would go into effect on July 9th. So therefore it would also be in effect for our ESY program, as well as our um, Keystone camp and anything else going on uh, related to, to summer school this summer. Our ESY program starts slightly before that, so um, I think there really shouldn't be too many differences from this uh, current plan um, and what we've been doing, except for the masking piece. So the first part, there are nine components, universal and correct wearing of masks. What our plan says, if you would just please scroll down to page four. further down to the, the table. There you go. We're just gonna go through those boxes. Basically what this plan says is that we are going to permit the voluntary wearing of masks in our, our school by staff and students. It also provides for an opportunity that if, in, if by any chance there are any additional state mandates for uh, mask wearing that come down from the state, that we would just automatically comply with those state mandates. We're not going to have a choice unless we give up the funding. And it also gives the superintendent the uh, flexibility to mandate masks temporarily 
in within certain schools or across the district. So for example, if um, all of a sudden we had another surge of a pandemic, either a similar pandemic or something new that comes down the pike, um, the superintendent would be able to mandate masks as such as if we were in a substantial area, a substantial range of community spread, or we had uh, an outbreak in a particular school building, the superintendent would have the authority to mandate mask wearing in that school or multiple schools across the district uh, in order to add another layer of protection uh, based on what the CDC recommends. So that would not require board approval. My personal preference would be that as long as we're staying in the low rate of community spread that we would, uh, or even in the medium, that our other layered efforts of protection would be enough mitigation efforts that I would try to avoid that. Um, in our community okay. surveys, it was very clear that uh, our staff and families in this particular area that responded to that survey were very much against having our students mask. And I know that there's more research that comes out regularly about the, the masking and that layer of protection. CDC is still saying that masking is another layer um, into the, the, the different mitigation efforts. And we're not going to deny anybody who wants to wear a mask, but we are not going to mandate that folks wear masks at, at this point in time. So I figured this might be probably the most, um, I guess, controversial piece of the plan, but I think this would be a great time. I'm interested in, in our board members and their feedback on that masking effort. If you want me to, I can go through the whole thing and we can come back to that. Okay. The next step is modifying facilities allow for physical distancing. Um, we are going to promote physical distancing to the maximum extent possible in our schools. That does not mean we are guaranteeing six feet of physical distancing. Um, some of the latest things from CDC include three feet, two inches is now the recommended space. And I think that's gonna continue to change as we go through. We cannot um, have all of our students in our schools and maintain six feet of distance at all times. However, we do believe there may be some parents who still request that their students have that six feet of distance. We will try to accommodate that when possible, but it's most likely going to be students who are in a virtual academy model. But by no means are we going to guarantee families um, six feet of distance at all times. We are still going to have some strategies ready to go to um, minimize the mixing of students, but it certainly I don't expect us to be as strict as we were last school year. I do see us using our cafeterias and our libraries and our large group areas again. Those were some of the most difficult things to navigate for our, our staff and our, our principals. So I do see us using those things. But I think that our um, folks have also learned the strategies behind cohorting and not mixing kids whenever possible. So um, those things are still probable, but we are going to um, promote physical distance where we can and when feasible. We did replace throughout the district water uh, fountains with water filling stations, which is part of this plan as well. Hand washing and respiratory etiquette, etiquette is still going to continue. We'll have signage, we'll have frequent hand washing breaks, so hand sanitizer and so forth will still be available for our students. I think that it's very difficult to argue that proper hand washing and um, respiratory etiquette is something that we shouldn't be doing whether we're in a pandemic or not. So we're going to maintain those healthy practices. Our buildings and facilities are going to be continue to be cleaned and sanitized on the same schedule that we've been using. We were doing extra cleaning and sanitizing in targeted areas and we'll continue to do that as well. And our HVAC fresh air is set, ventilation set at 25%. That's what we did throughout last school year. Contact tracing, isolation and quarantine. All of our administrators except I believe uh, two of our current administrative team is currently certified as a trained contact tracer through Johns Hopkins program. And those folks are, will be trained before the start of the school year. I know that Mr. Kondo is the Act 44 safety officer. Um, I've designated him to, um, and also Christina Manning to work together uh, for the contact tracing. Mark is usually the first point of contact with the Department of Health. Diagnostic and screening testing. This is a little bit different as well. We were doing mass diagnostic screening at the door by temperature taking. We are not planning to do mass temperature taking. Um, our administrative team discussed this at length and we believe that not one time did a hot temperature 
um, at the door in mass screening lead to a COVID connection. However, if anybody does have any potential symptoms, if they don't feel well, something we would send them to the nurse. The nurse may do some additional diagnostic screening, such as temperature taking and so forth, and then make any necessary steps with the parent. And then the last, or not the last, G would be efforts to provide vaccination to school communities. We are not going to, at this point in time, offer a clinic at, um, on site. However, um, I've been in contact with UPMC and Lockhaven University. And what they asked us to do was to hold off on scheduling any clinics at this time. They wanted to see how the drive-through clinic and what the response was going to be last week. I think it was Friday and Monday. Um, and then once that clinic was through, then we were going to plan forward if any additional clinics needed to be done. My, um, my position on that would be that we would work uh, strictly with UPMC in our area, um, as well as the, the folks at LHU and continue to promote the vaccination clinics that are in our area as opposed to being a vaccination site and that we would continue to provide information to families who wish to know where those vaccination sites are in our area or in our region. The next one would be students with disabilities. We're gonna to continue to provide the reasonable accommodations as appropriate with anybody who was in our, um, who qualifies as a student with disability. We would treat them respectfully responsible and also uh, take into account their individual disability when making any decisions for their safety. And the final one is that we would continue to collaborate with state and local health officials as needed as we continue to navigate through the final stages, hopefully the final stages of this pandemic. So you can see the two key differences would be stopping the temperature taking um, and the voluntary mask wearing. A few other procedural things such as not using the one-way hallways anymore. We don't believe that's necessary and we believe that we can use some of our large group areas again. So feedback from the board. I think it looks good. Uh, I think the, uh, the no mask mandatory masking is going to be well received by the majority of people and the fact that they can continue to do it i think it's good no i think uh, it looks pretty pretty common sense and i like it. i agree i think the no masking is a good thing a choice i also think it's kind of important that we get the kids back into the cafeteria to eat and not into classrooms i think that was not a good idea to begin with we were stuck with it, but I think that was a horrible idea. So I think that's a, a good thing. A horrible that, idea on the part of the administration, or the, this, I mean, <laughs> the government with their six foot, they put it so hard. Not the administration. Oh, I disagreed with the administration's view on that subject, but well, if you have better ideas, let us know. Oh, I did. I had a great idea. Put them in the cafeteria, plexiglass between every one of them. <laughs> All right. Anyone else? Um, it's Elizabeth here. Uh, thank you so much. It looks like it gives you a lot of flexibility, which I think everyone is looking forward to. Um, not that this question needs to be answered now, because who knows what August is going to look like? Who knows? But just maybe in the future, maybe next month or before school starts, um, like if a parent decides that they want to stay with the district, but for some reason they want to keep their child at home in classroom time and not be in a physical brick and mortar building, you know, what the plan is for those parents. I mean, like I said, I'm not looking for any answers right now or thoughts because we're only in June or July 1st, I'm sorry. Um, and also if there's any left over or will the district still be able to offer free masks for maybe kids that don't have any, if they want them at the school district. Yeah, Liz, that was, I, go ahead. No, no, thank you. Although otherwise it's, it's, this is about as good as we can hope for at this time. And thank you so much. I'd actually like to address both of your questions um, at this time. Um, let's start backwards kind of. The first question was about PPE or, or masks, but we are still, and I think it was in the section A, we're still providing personal protective equipment such as mask, shields, gowns, gloves, and plexiglass shields as requested uh, to staff. We also have enough masks to provide. Uh, we did not provide masks to students regularly or daily through the last year. But we do we did always keep some on hand, and we were delivered some cloth reusable masks uh, for students last year. So I think that there's some of those left over as well. So yes, if someone did need it, 
it really is a responsibility of the parent um, to provide that mask, but we will have some on hand um, for this additional assistance. And then I believe your next question actually goes into something, a, a different topic, which is what are the instructional options for families next year? And so I've had some deep discussion with um, the members of the team who helped develop this plan, draft this plan for you, as well as our entire A team today had a in more in-depth discussion. Based on uh, um, some very uh, good data, number one, instructional data, that shows that students who were synchronously remote for long periods of time or throughout the school year did not grow to the same degree that our students who were in face-to-face -face instruction or our students who were in virtual academy. We also, through anecdotal evidence of our comprehensive plan survey data that was given to all staff, students, and parents, showed that no, no one of those groups felt that remote synchronous learning was the way that anybody learns best. So com combining those two data points, anecdotal and hard numerical data, um, our administrative team does not recommend that we have a long-term remote option for students that fa families would need to choose face-to-face -face instruction or they could choose virtual academy. But I wanna make sure that we understand that choosing virtual academy is not our teachers. Uh, we have teachers who are assigned to virtual academy to support our students, but that the curriculum that they're using is intended for online curriculum. And so would switching from face-to-face -to, -face to virtual academy would almost be like switching schools. The order of the second grade math in virtual academy is not the same scope and sequence as the math in our face-to-face uh, -face curriculum. So it is two different curriculums and you would need to think of them as two different schools. However, we do have the capability um, and the skill for our teachers to be able to teach synchron synchronously remote. There may be situations in which some students are quarantining still throughout this school year. And when our administrative team looks at what's best for our students, we believe that temporary remote synchronous learning could be approved by a principal for very specific reasons that could include a quarantining effort. And in our mind, that short-term synchronous remote option could be utilized uh, for a maximum of 10 school days. So kind of putting a limit on it. If there's an extenuating circumstance, the superintendent would be able to extend that but principals could permit up to 10 days of synchronous remote per student per incident. If it's a longer illness of some kind, or um, that would then lend itself more to um, homebound instruction and some other options. We thought too that there could be some instances where maybe a student uh, unfortunately broke their leg. They didn't need to go to homebound for six weeks, but for a week they needed to be you know, laid up and immobilized at home, but yet they were able to log in synchronously remote. So on a case-by-case -case basis for something related to pandemic, quarantines, isolation, so forth, or a medical need of a short term that we would approve synchronous remote. Students who would go on an educational trip could not just log on synchronous remote. They're on an educational trip. We're not gonna expect our teachers to accommodate that. We're talking about our teachers accommodating situations that are beyond the student's control. But we know that what's best for the student is not sending a packet home when we have the capability to synchronously remote. So that's kind of where we are. We haven't formalized that plan and pushed it out to the families yet. I wanted to share that with you tonight along with the health and safety plan and to get your feedback on, on that position of learning options. Can I actually, go ahead, Ryan. I actually like that, but I do have a question. Um, God forbid the new variant that's out there, it comes in, are we still set up to go back into this just in case? Yes. Um, when you say go back into this, you mean go full back remote? into the full remote. Yes. Get, I mean, everybody's. I would say, um, and I'm going to just ask, look at the administrative team for some nonverbal cues, head shaking, whatever you feel, thumbs up. Uh, we're definitely in a much better position to pivot to full remote with little notice if necessary. That's perfect. Well, wasn't that uh, actually a part of the plan with, uh, with the bid days and so forth too, where if we right. had to use one of those uh, because of snow day or uh, power outage or whatever might happen, have a closed building, we don't want to have that prep and have all the 
before he worked in, in the school and he and the other LMSs already. So thank you for bringing that up, Bo. Um, FID days are actually a something separate this year. It's called a flexible instructional day. Keystone Central is not approved for FID days. I do think we should get it approved for the following school year because this year, last month, you approved an alternate uh, plan to the 180 uh, days of school year that could, didn't have to look like a traditional school day. We did the same thing last year. We are permitted, the superintendent can, on an inclement weather day for this school year, call a remote learning day in lieu of a snow day. What I would like to do now that we have a solid plan of accountability for all employees on a snow day is use remote learning days for inclement weather days. Let's see how it goes. And there's no limitation on that. If we have 10 snow days, you can do there's that. There's no times. limitation. Okay. There's no limitation. Now within that, there is some caveats or just a, a unexpected remote day. There's some um, wiggle room there for students to have some days to make up work because we do know that some students still aren't going to be able to log on, but in order to be kind of present, they're gonna have three days to make up the, the work that was expected of them on those days. We would plan for nurses, a plan for counselors um, and so forth. If we were to go out more on a pandemic related long-term closure, um, we can, that gives us more time to talk with our school nurses, our counselors, our different people to do some other things with them as well. But everybody ha will have, prior to the start of the first day of school, expectations for a inclement weather remote learning day. <clears throat> if we find that that's not working, we don't, the superintendent doesn't have to call a remote learning day. The superintendent has the ability to say, we're going to have a, a traditional snow day and we're gonna tack it on at the end of the year. But I think we should give it a try. We haven't tried it. Um, I think there's a lot of families who want us to use that option, and there's a lot of families who don't want us to use that option. But I can tell you there were a lot more families complaining when we tacked five days on in June than there were <coughs> the other end. So I think we should give it a try and see how it goes. I, correct me if I'm wrong, but I thought last year, we said we were going to do that and get it set up for this this coming year. You're not wrong. We did that, Roger, and we didn't have any more snow days. We got it set up in May, March. We got it finalized, I think, a plan in March, but we didn't have any more snow I think days. Roger means state approval. Yeah, the state. I'm talking. The no. bid day? Yeah. We I did not we, do bid day approval. We talked about doing it, but we didn't okay. because we didn't need to. And, and here... My, my personal, um, I guess, concern with FID days is when I talk with the other superintendents who had FID days, FID days were required to be asynchronous learning. We just invested millions of dollars in equipment so that we could continue the learning of our kids to go on a snow day and give them asynchronous learning. It kind of defeats the purpose of everything we were trying to get to. You have a random lesson plan for a snow day that was not necessarily continuing the learning we were on. Sure. You look like you had a question. That's why. No. Okay. So, Elizabeth, does that answer your question about the um, potential learning options for Keystone Central? Super terrific. I mean, uh, thank you so much. I, and I really sincerely mean that. There's no other concerns for board members. Um, starting next week, we'll put together the um, literature to push out to our uh, families so that they can get their decisions made. And um, <laughs> we're also reaching out. I, I've talked to some homeschool families who are planning to come back. And also we have uh, um, plans in the works for reaching out to the families in our area who have maybe selected a different cyber charter so that we can share with them some of the things that we're doing and the additional supports that we've put in place for our virtual academy for the upcoming year. Is there gonna be an, op uh, an opportunity for once families see this health and safety plan, if they still aren't sure about sending their kids back, will they have an opportunity to review the virtual academy curriculum? Yep. One of the things we're not going to permit <coughs> is students randomly switching from face-to-face -face into virtual academy. So. We're going to enroll students on uh, marking periods unless there's some extenuating circumstances, but people cannot um, shift back and forth. Consistency, that's only fair to the staff and um, 
like I said, it's like changing schools you know, from a curriculum standpoint. No, I'm, I'm personally glad that we're not going to give that option for remote learning this year because I think it was just it was just too difficult uh, for parents, for teachers, for for the students. I mean, it was it was too difficult to monitor it, and uh, a lot of the kids I think were just weren't being supervised well enough in, in the scene. And I think your data is going to prove that out. The fact that they just weren't the achievement and the progress wasn't there. So I'm, I'm glad that we're going full in person. I agree with you, Jeff. I, although I, I have to say, I think there's some silver lining there. Um, our, our teachers stepped up and even though it was difficult, they did it. Some of them did it very well. It was hard, but mm -hmm. some of them learned to do it very well. And in addition to that, I, I think it also shows you how powerful that face-to-face -face instruction is and the power of social learning uh, in a classroom. I think what happens when you're on Zoom, and even though you have a full classroom of students, the teacher can be excellent, there's still a lot of things where only one person can be physically heard at one time. Uh, you can go into breakout rooms, but the teacher can't be in every breakout room. And so when you're talking about young children as opposed to adults or college-level students that have more independent uh, learning skills, it, it's a different game. Yeah, I, I just, I did, I know that they did, you know, as well as they could do. I mean, it's, it was a tough situation for everybody, especially the teachers and everyone, the parents and everything. And I'm just, I know it was a tough year and I'm just glad that we're able to come back to some kind of normalcy this year. So, but. The next one would be the budget presentation. Chad, you, you throw that one up there since you've got the magic touch going on. All right, this will be Susan and I. The reason we wanted to bring um, a budget update back to you was that the governor did sign the state budget, which had some implications on state funding as well as some federal funding being released to us that was being held up at the state level through the ARP ESSER um, round. Next slide. Um, you can see, we just wanted to show you exactly how, how much money um, is there a change based on the governor's budget. We, we, weren't, we did not count on an increase, but we got an increase. <laughs> and so under basic education, we're getting another allocation of 482, uh, 823. We do expect that um, that amount of money would then be part of our revenue from the state annually. So that would be an annual increase that we'd see year after year under this formula. And then under special education, an additional 133, 359. Again, that would be funding that would be sustained through future budgets as well, um, coming out of the basic ed funding and special ed funding. And then under the ESSER funding, additional money, um, they did things a little differently this time. Susan, correct me if I'm, I'm wrong, but they did it a little bit differently. Instead of just giving us that flat pot of 830,000 in, in this one, they um, are telling us where we need to spend it and then are putting some additional constraints on the spending within those buckets, if you will. So the three buckets for the ARP ESSER round is learning loss, summer enrichment, and after school programs. And then within the learning loss, 30% of that amount of money needs to be spent on social emotional learning. So we have not had a chance to sit down with the administrative team and determine how those allocations are going to work. Um, although what Susan and I have talked about a little bit and included Mark in some of those discussions would be, again, being very wise about how we're utilizing this money and then you are permitted to supplant current funding with this money, which would then be a recommendation from us to earmark specific funds for future use in the area of personnel, technology, and some of those areas so that you're almost extending the time frame to use this money because it has to be spent by September 30th, 2024. So if we supplant some costs that we have, um, have some other ideas. We'd, we'd like to run or after, continue to run after school programs throughout next year and a couple years that also include that activity bus, that late bus, 
which then that means that gives us a whole lot of other options for, um, let me say detention, drug and alcohol classes, vaping classes, um, some other things that we couldn't do before where students wouldn't have a ride. Our student athletes would have um, access to activity buses home. We're not gonna do, we're not gonna recommend to you door to door service, but um, regional drops for um, after school activities. And so we don't have a finalized plan. We started drafting one. We gotta get some numbers together and um, we wanna bring a proposal back to you for some after school programs, some summer enrichment, and also um, the learning loss we believe will just help us continue not only with some curricular initiatives, um, some technology software, but also um, some of those after school or before school programs that, that come up. So we'll work closely with the finance committee uh, on how we want to map out the use of these funds in out years and um, continue to keep things rolling. So there's the long-term strategy committer assigned the fund balance in the following areas. Capital projects was also another area we supplant. We cannot use direct um, ESSER funding for capital projects, but if you supplant appropriate costs, you can then push your fund balance. We won't know. I keep pushing Susan for an answer on how we're going to finish the year. Uh, you know how she is. She won't tell us until October, until it's final. Um, but I suspect that we'll be in good shape and our fund balance is in a healthy place that earmarking some funds for future use would be pretty wise. And questions from the board on the additional funding that came into the district. We do not recommend that you reopen the budget. We just wanted you to be aware. Now, will this increase the amount that we have to give the charter school? No, the charter school gets their own allocation outside of right. this. Yes, their money what about the, the non-pub too, or do we have to give non-pub? No non-pub. They were a little stricter on the, the allocation. They didn't, they weren't as free as Esther one and two. With here's the pot of money, do with it what you will. So we have to be a little more strategic about how we're mm -hmm. earmarking. That's all I have. Thank you. No one signed up to speak? Oh, superintendent's report. Yeah, three key items, all good news. Um, the first is Mill Hall Elementary has received a $5,000 grant from the Choose Kindness Foundation as part of our PBIS program uh, in collaboration with Kelly Swartwood. Um, Dr. Brian um, was able to secure these funds um, to purchase PBIS Reward Program, which is an online tracking system uh, to acknowledge the students who demonstrate the expectations. Um, of the system, which includes being kind. Um, they wanna also purchase some books focused on teaching students how to demonstrate the four pillars of kindness, offer help, reach out, show appreciation and be friendly. Um, those books will be purchased for all of the classrooms there. And then also some, some lesson plans for teachers to um, teach these pillars directly. And so this will help them, this $5,000 will help them implement that program. I believe that a few other schools um, are looking to obtain the same grant funding and we'll let you know if they're successful in doing so. Charles Harder um, is a Central Mountain High School student enrolled in our Career and Tactical Center Precision Machining Program. He, I think you were aware that he placed um, high enough in the state to move on to the national contest. And he brought home a third place medal in the CNC Milling Specialist Contest in the Skills USA National Leadership Conference. So that is a pretty big um, achievement that we're, we're very proud of. I know that some pictures and some things have been sent out to the media um, very recently. Um, just also of note, Charles is a sophomore. Um, he just finished his sophomore year, so we believe that he will have an opportunity to compete the next two years if he chooses to do so. And, and um, I'll put money on the fact that the two kiddos ahead of him were probably older than he was. So <laughs> hopefully um, Charles will have a great shot at that national title next year. And then one more um, item of note, I'm sure that many of you have seen the social media posts or um, our local media, but Jocelyn Renninger, a graduating senior from Central Mountain High School, won the title of Laurel Queen at the Laurel Queen Festival this year in June. So we're super proud of uh, Jocelyn and anybody that knows her um, probably is aware that she's definitely um, a wonderful representative of the, of the Laurel Festival. Um, and I know that our uh, 
Laura and to Laura that represented Bucktail also had a fine showing at the pageant as well. So shout out to both young ladies and thank you for representing Keystone Central in such a positive way. Thank you. Move on to our committee reports. Anything from curricular or co-curricular? I know we haven't met since the this last four minutes. Oh. Jeff, can I skip you for a minute? <laughs> Sure. I know it's going to be a bit. All right. Finance committee. Uh, again, we haven't met. Have met. Personnel. Uh, personnel did meet. Uh, obviously, because it's personnel items, I can't uh, can't say what it was about. But uh, okay. personnel did meet on, uh, I believe it was the uh, 21st of last month. All right. Policy, Mr. Co. The policy committee will meet have its first meeting on august the 11th uh so we kind of shut down during the summer and we'll be back on the 11th of august thank you wayne safety and security we're uh not going to be meeting until august okay. also unless something comes up that needs to be addressed okay. charter ad hoc uh charter ad hoc has not had the chance to meet uh we had uh, a conflict by the last uh, scheduled meeting time so hopefully we'll get it in this month yeah I do. our charter ad hoc group we have to regroup on a date and time i will always have a standing conflict on the date that we pick <laughs> so uh, we may need to regroup okay no problem all right jen all right <laughs> so ladies uh i do have a uh, a number of items here to share with everybody uh, the facilities committee met just two days ago, uh, this past Tuesday, and we had a lot on our agenda. A lot of it uh, focuses and actually is reflected later in your um, agenda here as items that we uh, will be needing to uh, approve next week. First of all, uh, you hopefully have had a chance uh, when you looked at the agenda to, for this, uh, this evening's meeting to look at the uh, 10 year updated revised 10 year facility plan. And uh, I think we discussed this, well, everything kind of tied into this that we discussed or just about everything into the 10 year plan. And there are items that are, are located in that plan at some point or another as, as we go through it. Uh, you'll note that it was color coded for a reason. Uh, there were three different colors on that 10 year plan and the you have red black and blue not the black and blue is we're bruising here financially because we're not but uh it's uh the red on there indicated the uh of course the uh, projects and so on that are, we're going to use the bond funding for um there the black is money that's coming out of the capital funds and the blue are are things most almost all of them are in fact i think all of them are athletic related and that does not mean that those numbers there so you don't get really worked up or, or worried about it because those numbers are just projected as to what things could cost we don't know what they are going to be at all until we get the facility study athletic facility study that uh, we, we are hopefully going to approve to to have um, move forward uh, that will be I'll me mentioned here in a minute but the those all those items there are things that could possibly be included in that um, athletic complex that we're hopefully going to um, be able to do here sometime in the in the future but the facility study will kind of drive all of that obviously so the the items that are on that that, that were included in the 10-year plan at some point at different po uh, places in this study the athletic study i they met with uh, i guess the administration met with i believe four firms uh, to select the one to to uh, approve for this uh, athletic study to go ahead and do the feasibility study and I believe there was a, uh, a company from uh, State College that was was uh, recommended uh, for a couple of different reasons. Namely, uh, I think that 
Uh, Rob has worked with them before and is, was very pleased with them. And also for, um, you know, the fact that they're local and I think they could probably get to it quickly. We are trying to look at probably a, probably an October return date for uh, that to come back so we can see what, what they're gonna recommend and what it may cost. So that, that is one of the other items here on your, and, and it's, we have a cap that had, I believe $11,000 if I'm not mistaken. So that will be, that's on your agenda as well. Third item we talked about was uh, uh, an item of gym repair. Uh, we had, unfortunately, we had some kind of a, a leak, a pipe had some problems and we had one of the heavy rainstorms here about a month ago and it was, uh, did some damage to the gym floor. And so we had to get that, have to get that repaired. Uh, the cost to that, as you see, um, or will see, is approximately $73,000. All $25,000 are deductible is 25, and the insurance company will pay the result remaining. So that will be, they'll come in and do a complete repair of the gym floor and to the point where it will be uh, good for another seven to 10 years. That also, I believe, was included in, uh, in the 10 year plan as uh, coming out of the capital funds. And Susan, you can correct me if I'm, if I'm making any mistakes here as far as where the funding is coming from. The next item that we discussed was the uh, replacement of the bucktail freezer and the cooler replacement that uh, was being uh, also because we've had, we're able to use some additional uh, bond funding we were able to use that bond funding for replacing the bucktail freezer, which is something that does need to be done. And I think it's gonna make it a much better situation up there uh, for the cafeteria. Uh, the next item we discussed was the, the this stone parking lot here in, at this building. And it was, it's been unpaved for the entire lifetime of the building. And they do need at this point additional parking very badly. And so again, we were able to use some of the bond funding for this. And it mainly for a health or a safety reason that, that this should be, plus the fact not only safety reasons that it needs to be surfaced and paved, but also because the need, you know, it's it's so we can number each of these parking places for students, student parking and so on, so we can get stickers and so on <coughs> for uh, student parking. So this uh, is being recommended for uh, paving and have it ready to go for, and also uh, there'll be an additional sidewalk from that that will be included in that. So it should be, it's something that it has needed to be done for a long, long time. And, uh, we're, we're able to do it now with some of that, uh, some of that, also the bond funding as well. The next item was the Bucktail and Central Mountain High School scoreboard replacements. Uh, those, uh, this scoreboard replacement also was out of bond funding. And those, we really need to get that approved ASAP because uh, I think they're, they have a turnaround time of they're saying eight to 12 weeks, like everything else, even anybody that's ordered anything lately, it's usually eight to 12 weeks, even if you want a pair of shoes or something. So we need to get that approved. Um, the funding is there for it and uh, the Bucktail and CMHS scoreboards. Uh, hopefully we can get them back and get them installed in time for football season. The next item, uh, we have money in the capital fund that is made, that's, that's put out every year uh, for, uh, I guess, flooring and so on. And this year we decided that some of the, there's some real need up at Liberty Curtin Elementary for some replace, floor replacement. And so it's being recommended that we use 
uh, $20,000 uh, of the capital funding to do that this year of the uh, money that has already been budgeted for that type of a, of a project. Next item, I'm almost done. <laughs> the next item is uh, for a purchase of a Kubota mower. And before everybody says, wait a minute, haven't we just bought a lot of mowers? Yes, we did. This is a replacement. This is not a new purchase. The one that is being replaced is, I think, came over with the pilgrims on the Mayflower. It's pretty old. And uh, they did check into getting the parts for repair. And by the time they paid for getting it repaired, it's like uh, trying to repair an old refrigerator or something. It usually gets to be more cost effective to just replace it. So um, this uh, is for uh, it's the bucktail mower, actually. And it's uh, we were going to be able to sell the old one at the surplus sale, so maybe recoup some of that investment. But uh, this is uh, strictly a replacement. It's not new equipment. So I wanted to make that really clear. And also, while I'm thinking about it, um, well, I'll hold that till the end. Last item we discussed was the facilities, facilities fee schedule. Uh, in the past, we've, we passed a policy for facilities use, uh, but in the past, it's been kind of a little fuzzy and vague as to who's going to pay, who, what they pay, uh, you know, for how long of a building use, uh, you know, which groups will, we're going to ask to pay, which groups are going to be able to use it, use it at no charge. Uh, the administration has come up with a, I think, a, a really pretty sound plan here and pretty succinct as to who can use it. And they have assigned fees for the buildings, for the, whether it's a room or whatever. If it's a booster club, uh, and I think Roger asked this question, um, we will we'll charge them if they're gonna use it for a, an extended kind of a fundraising activity. If they wanna use the library for a meeting at night or some classroom or something, there won't be any charge for that. But uh, if, if it is, uh, and it's all spelled out in that uh, the AR that was put together, which I think uh, actually, it's kind of, I think Jackie said at our meeting that was kind of a, a midpoint between not charging anybody anything and charging everybody for the use of the building. It, it's a good hybrid between those two, those two uh, positions. And so I think uh, it, I, I think it looks good and hopefully you'll have a chance to look at it uh, between now and next week. But uh, I, I think so it's that it's piece just for clarification as an, as an AR does not require board approval, but right. I wanted to make sure that before I approve that as an AR, um, to go along with the updated policy 707 that the board was clear and was in support of the fee structure. So what I can do is make sure I email that document out to all of you because I don't think it's on the board agenda. So um, Okay, I'm sorry, I thought it was yeah. on there. And just one last item here before I, I end here. Uh, we, at our last meeting, not the one in June, at our May meeting, uh, we had a presentation by Rich Wyckoff from the uh, some representatives from the Renova area, and they presented uh, some a proposal about there was there's some uh, stone pillars that were remain left over from I guess the Seventh Street School up in in the right in town there that they've had around for I guess quite a while, and he showed us some pictures and so on, and wanted to know if there was any way that we could use those up at uh, well, we're doing all the work at the, at the high school this summer. Uh, yeah, I just, they're, if you've seen it, they're really huge and they would be really difficult to, to move. And, and I'm not even sure what we, what we could, how we could even incorporate those. So I think um, at this, at this point, um, I, I would just like to thank them for their, for the presentation and for coming to us uh, with, with that, uh, suggestion but I, I just at this point i don't really think that we are going to be able to do anything with those um, unless you know board members have any further thoughts on it uh, i would say thank you but i think that at this point we can really incorporate them anyway so i think that's it
thank you for, <laughs> for listening to the long-winded report, but we did cover a lot of ground the other day, and I wanted everybody to be aware, because a lot of it is, as I, I said, reflected in later on down here in this agenda, a lot of those items. So unless anybody has any questions, thank you. Thank you. Treasurer's report, financials report, and student enrollment reports. Board members have any questions on those? Go on with to board business. Um, going to retain vote to retain uh, Wally Bollinger for legal counsel, legal services. Uh, same with uh, David Lindsay. James Fry, any questions on those with the attorney? Okay. Then there's both of the health and safety plans, one for K through 12 and then also one for the CTC. They are identical, we just are required to submit one for each A unit. And then there's the articulation agreement with Jersey Shore CTC um, that we discussed um, before had a little presentation about and we'll approve that. Any questions on that? And we have our minutes from the work session and the voting session uh, from last month and also from the co-curricular curricular meeting. Any comments or questions on those? Madam President. Yes, Wayne. Uh, could you speak more directly into your microphone? I'm having a terrible time hearing you. Sorry, Wayne, is that better? That's much better. Thank you. Alrighty, sorry. Is there anything you need me to go back over? Nope. All right. All right. So moving on to business then, you'll notice that right now there is no link for the bills for payment. Since yesterday was month end, um, it takes a little bit of time for Susan to compile all that. I know. <laughs> <laughs> so she said it'll be there Tuesday for us to look at. Um, then we have an agreement um, for education and treatment alternatives. That's paid by title grant funds. And professional development and consultation through uh, successful practices network for up to six days in the school year. Um, also paid by title grant funds. And this one, I think I want to check in on <laughs> exotic adventures. I, I would hope that you would ask exotic, about that. Exotic, <laughs> exotic Ed, animals, adventures, adventures. So, um, <laughs> just wanted to mention that that is um, an agreement for this group to bring in some live animals for the end of Keystone Camp because they have a theme that has to do with animals, and they thought it would be a nice treat for the children to bring the animals to Keystone Camp. Not affiliated with Joe Exotic or any of his animals, is it? Carol I'll Aston. defer to Megan. <laughs> no, no ill intent. <laughs> probably considered a little. <laughs> probably. That's what I'm thinking. So that is paid for by the Esther Grant funds. Um, I'm kind of picturing Clyde peeling on wheels. <laughs> Uh, the next one is the study, a three-year agreement for Study Island for the program license, and that is paid for also by the ESSER grant funds. And um, Read to Achieve from McGraw Hill, um, paid for by ESSER grant funds. I believe that's, is that the three through eight reading curriculum? No, that's no sorry. Okay. Seven and eight grade reading. Okay, great. And then the next one is confident learning learner model for uh, curriculum for autistic support programs. And that's paid for by general funds. That is a perfect example of something we may want to charge to the ESSER grant now that we have new allocation, but our original intent was general funds. So if we have an opportunity to discuss it and change it for next week, we may be able to do that. Okay. And an agreement with McCarthy and Associates for tax audit and consultation, consultation services paid for by the general fund. 
Um, next is the Clark Agreement for Actually, repairs. I'm sorry, go ahead. That one is paid for by the tax fund. So oh, it has general fund here. So let's see. Oh, is it? Did that change later today? Okay, sorry, my printout was different time. That's okay. <laughs> mm -hmm. All right. Um, so going to Clark Fund, or yeah, the Clark Agreement for repairs to the high Bucktail Area High School. Um, that's paid from the 2020 bond issuance. And then as uh, Jeff touched on the updated 10-year facilities plan. Um, the next one's a right away um, between the district and UGI utilities. And um, yeah. Question on that one. Didn't we approve that last month? We discussed it we last okay. discussed it. Gotcha. Month. My apologies. That's okay. It's, it's, I'm glad it sounded familiar. <laughs> <laughs> And then, as Jeff also discussed, um, to approve ELA sports for the uh, athletic feasibility study, not to exceed 11,000 paid for by the capital fund. Tracy? Yes, Elizabeth. Hi, if I could just add a quick consideration. Um, for the, the study everyone's very excited about, <clears throat> if it's not too disruptive to the administration, um, Whenever they, if they could let us know for the folks, the board members that are on the facilities committee, when they have their administrative committee members meetings with the consultant, if we could also be invited, um, we'd deeply be appreciated, but just something to think about. Thank you. The next one is an approval agreement with RL abatement for repairs to the floor at Liberty Curtain, paid for by the capital fund. And next one is approval three agreements for the Bucktail Freezer Cooler Replacement Project. And that is from the 2020 bond issuance. And then the Clark Agreement for the Stone Lot Project at the high school. And that's also paid from the bond issuance. And then the daughter equipment quote um, for the purchase of the replacement mower. I have a question. Yes. Rob, uh, my question would be, has would it behoove the district to look at how much we're spending in manpower and in equipment on mowing and to see if we could put a bid out or at least do a little checking to see if there's any lawnmower services around here or mowing services that would also would entertain making a bid for something like that because it could end up being cheaper having an outside source coming mow as opposed to how much money we're spending on mowers and manpower. But I'm just curious, Robin, is there any thought to that process? Yeah, <clears throat> excuse me. Yeah, we actually did look at that earlier in the year. Susan had me do some research. I met with a couple different firms that did some commercial mowing and looking at the cost per day, what they usually got versus what we can do it for. It was uh, far more expensive to have them come in. And then we, we struggled with some of the stuff with uh, some of our field maintenance and some of the specialty things we did. But Susan did have me look at some of that earlier in the year and uh, we kind of wrote it off uh, pretty quickly because of the, the cost. No problem, thank you. We also we have collective bargaining agreements. Yeah. Rob, um, yeah, I'm just, Kind of curious, are you blacked out so that uh, to hide your identity? Because your name's on the board. Well, I think it's uh, because I have, I'm facing the sun. I'm sitting outside. I think I'm facing the sun. I'm not going to turn around, but be in the witness protection you can look at it however you want. Okay, sorry. I, just, I had to throw that out there, you know. Well, okay. All right, so moving on, uh, we have our personnel agenda. Um, several hires and transfers, and the, along with the bid day list from this year. And then we have the athletic and student uh, personnel agenda and a list of coaches. Can I just go back to the personnel agenda. There are several hires on there. I met with um, all of the new hires, <laughs> many of them today, and um, Many, uh, many of them are hired in special education. Following bid day, we had a lot of special education vacancies. 
it was actually really inspiring to talk with some of these young hires and people coming from out of state. Some are, uh, many are Keystone Central graduates, um, recent graduates at Lock Haven University, but some are also coming from other school districts in the region um, because of the things that are going on here and wanted to be part of the Keystone Central team. So I um, had a wonderful afternoon meeting with several of these candidates and just wanted you to notice there'd be quite a few folks on, on this month. Um, our goal was to um, anticipate new hires and get those processes moving quickly so we could get um, approval sooner in hopes that people coming from other districts would not be held for 60 days um, so it wouldn't be short on the beginning of the school year. So I just want to also say thank you to um, Dr. Barnhart and the HR department, Mark and, and Tracy, for their hard work in getting this done so quickly this year. And part of that, wasn't there a... You wanted us to also approve you to fill positions as needed um, before the next meeting. Yeah, necessary. so typically we do that at the August meeting so that I have the ability to appoint anybody to get the school year started. Um, between now and the next time we are together in August for a voting meeting, um, we did have hired some new head coaches recently, and those head coaches are looking to fill their assistant coaching positions. If we wait until the August voting meeting, um, we, if I could have the authority to appoint those folks so that they could get started with their athletic teams at the start of the, the season um, and preseason, that would be helpful if you're willing to do that. Yeah, I guess we just need to see a resolution put on the agenda to do so. I think it's on there, isn't it? It, it is on there. Somewhere. You have it on the personnel? Okay. Mm -hmm. Very last part of personnel. I mean, it wouldn't be um, if you did provide that okay. yeah. authority. Um, it wouldn't necessarily just be for coaches, but it does allow us to get people um, appointed so that they can resign from previous positions and avoid being held. Mm -hmm. So it just kind of speeds things up for us. It, it's really right. difficult for people to to not start the school year with us if we can at all avoid that. And we are at the mercy of the um, the other district because they do have the right to hold the, the their folks. And then also under athletics, um, additional summer fundraisers um, that were submitted for approval. Looks like Mr. Beltry has been very busy. Mm -hmm. to the girls soccer. So that's great. <laughs> uh, under negotiations, we have an MOU. Um, with the custodian. And then a couple of uh, grievances. <clears throat> any questions on any of that? <laughs> All right. Does anybody from the board have anything else? I'll make a motion. Uh, Tracy? To oh, I'm so sorry. Tracy? Tracy? Yes. yes, Elizabeth. Yes, I did have one quick thing. Um, yes. Just something to consider. I think a couple months ago we talked that the finance committee, I believe I remember this correctly, that the finance committee was gonna look at internet service <clears throat> for our students, et cetera, and see where the weak spots are, what might be needed. Now that now that the county also got some monies, now I have no idea what the county's ideas are. That's not my it's not my business, right? You know. But what I'm trying to say is with all the pot of money that's coming in in different little places. And we do know that we have some internet weaknesses uh, for our students in certain areas. Maybe the finance committee or someone, whoever the administration believes would be the right entity, um, potentially partner with the county and see if maybe we can partner with professionalism or financing or I don't know, but it just seems like a once in a lifetime chance and I hate to see us not take advantage of it. We were at least try. So I was wondering how the other board members felt about that. That would be up to uh, Now the last thing I knew um, 
I haven't had word from anybody at the county about any joint efforts. Um, last thing I'm aware of was that I pushed out information for our families, asking them to fill out a, a yet another survey um, that would help school districts determine the areas of need. And I have not seen the final results of that survey data, but I know that survey data is what's supposed to be used to apply for grant funding um, that would be outside of the, the money that we talked about earlier this evening. And so I'm kind of waiting to see how that plays out because uh, in my, talk, my conversations with Katie De Silva, um, we're trying to wait and see, is it the school district's responsibility, the county's responsibility, the state's responsibility, whose responsibility is it to um, really take on the fiber issues and, and the extra things. So I, I don't have any updates for you at this time. I was kind of waiting for some of that data to come back around to us. Well, no, I absolutely. That's why I just keep, please keep us posted because at least once the conversation, sounds like the conversations are starting and there's other priorities out there. We all know that, <laughs> but um, like I said, this might be a once in a lifetime chance. So well, there's a big pot of money um, sitting at the federal government for broadband in mm -hmm. rural areas yep. across the nation, but yep. who's going to get that money and who's going to manage those projects um, are some questions that have yet to be determined, but we will keep the pulse on it. This is something I've actually uh, been following fairly closely, uh, you know, having been involved in uh, the internet service provider world uh, some time ago and uh, I you know, still like to keep my fingers on the pulse of the industry and uh, look at what's out there, uh, you know, from many, many rounds of, of federal funding and so forth. Uh, I will tell you that sometimes these things aren't quite as easy as, uh, as they look. Uh, they are, when they say, when they say uh, rural broadband grants, uh, apparently somebody has a different idea than what we do of what rural is. They're thinking rural would be downtown Lock Haven, not uh, East Keating Township or something like that. And uh, unfortunately, the the way that a lot of these things are structured, uh, the companies that are agile enough to build into uh, the the really rural areas aren't large enough to be competitive to get the grants awarded. And they normally go to the major carriers who look at it and say, "Okay, we." We'd like to build there, but we're, we're going to go here instead. And it, it, it gets really, really nasty. Um, and I, I'll tell you, until you've had to file FCC form 477s and, and look at census track data and so forth, uh, it, it'll make your head spin. I mean, it, it, it's absolutely a worthwhile effort. It's, it's something that, that if we can be helpful in, in seeing those areas get the grants that, that they that they most certainly need, and we, we should ab absolutely be an advocate for that. It's just the actual execution that normally falls off and doesn't go the way you want it to, because the people who, like I said, have the ability to do it, they can't invest $10 million up front in order to get another $10 million worth of grant funding or something like that. It's, it's unfortunate, and like I said, it doesn't mean that we shouldn't be, you know, proactive and, and advocate for that type of thing. I just want to warn you, it's, it's not the, the simple process that uh, you'd think would happen overnight. These, it, uh, it's, it's loaded with bureaucracy at all levels and uh, move, move, moving a railroad's easier. <laughs> well, thank you, Bo. I mean, your input's probably, um, we couldn't ask for a better board member as far as technology goes, et cetera, but again, just if the conversations can start, at least maybe we'll have our boots on the ground. That's all we can do at this point. But thank you very much. Madam President. Yes, sir. There is a motion on the floor that has been duly seconded. Okay. Before that, Elizabeth and Wayne, you're going to be getting an email with a Zoom link for executive session following this meeting. We would say. Okay, thank quick. you. So we have a motion and a second to adjourn. Thank you, everyone. Have a good